Hello, my name is Kate Oman and I'm a freelance set and costume designer. I've been doing it for about 20 years and I've made this video to explain the process of what a designer goes through when they're designing a play or an opera, a musical or an installation. Um, the process is pretty much the same. Um, I'm going to talk to you about all the different jobs I've done just from starting off as a theatre designer. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how the process begins, talking to the director, the research stage, looking for clues in the script, how they might act as starting points, and the process in terms of sketching, model making, the collaborations that take place, and some of the different stages of the technical aspects of putting on a show. I thought I'd start by talking about some of the other things I've ended up doing just by being a set and costume designer. Um, if you decide to pursue a career in this, then you'll find that the skills and experience you acquire and the contacts you meet usually end up with you doing lots of other things around the industry. So I've done some art direction for film, for feature film, for music videos, for adverts and um, installation design, fashion design. I've designed sets and costumes for a video game, um, lots of bespoke prop making. And because as a um, set design, you end up making lots of things because you're you end up being good at model making hopefully and you just find as well in your early career if you're doing smaller shows that you just end up making a lot of the stuff yourself because you might not have the budget to pay someone to make it. Um, lots of costumes, event design, um, film as I've mentioned already, uh, theatre design obviously, uh, fashion shows and a lot of graphic design is involved as well so you find that you just sort of turn your hand to lots of different things which makes it really fun and you don't get bored. To get back to what I'm going to be talking to you about today, which is the theatre design process, the way that we start at the beginning is you'll have a conversation with the director. So you'll get any initial ideas or thoughts about the location, the setting, the, the year it might be set, any casting ideas, any big themes, and just initial concepts and, and ideas and thoughts. Some directors like to give you lots of information at the beginning, some like to just give you the script and, and let you come up with your first initial impressions. I wanted to mention here as well that budgets do have a bearing on these initial conversations and, and everyone goes into these projects knowing how much money is available at the end of the day. But I always try and um, not think too much about budgets at this stage, keep my ideas really open and ambitious because there are usually some creative ways of getting around the ideas and achieving them with, with limited budgets. So my favourite stage of the process is the research and I use all of the following to get ideas. So films, books, libraries, exhibitions, museums, podcasts, newspapers, magazines, history, art, music, my past experiences, theatre I've seen, opera I've seen, nature, everything. And it's ongoing throughout the whole process. So as you're going along, you'll get new ideas and those ideas will need to be researched. So you're, you're coming at them with all the information at your disposal. So I try not to just use the internet. I've got lots of books at home that I refer to. I'll tear things out of magazines. Um, I use Pinterest a lot. And it's really your unique experiences and everything that interests you and your particular viewpoint of the world that brings something special and unique to a project as a designer. So don't underestimate your point of view, your experiences, and just you know pay attention to the world around you because all of those things impact, all of those things seep into your subconscious and you use all of them when you're designing. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about how I use the script for clues. So, I'll start by, say, by thinking to myself, where are we? So geographically, does this matter? Are we going to pick somewhere as part of this process? So, you know, if you're designing a Shakespeare and you're reimagining it um, so it's relevant to an audience today, where in the world is going to resonate with an audience um, and how is this going to add to the atmosphere so where are we socially who are the people who are inhabiting these spaces that we're creating on stage what tensions and challenges do they have um, what is going on in their lives 
And politically, does this have an impact? Who's in power? How is this affecting things? Um, what are the struggles and tensions of the people that we're looking at on stage? Historically, what year is it? Does it matter what year it is? Are we trying to set it in a in a place that is that feels timeless, but it's resonating with an audience? Um, if we are setting it in a particular time, if it's a historical play, or we're picking a time in history where an historical event has a relevance to what we're trying to say, does that period of time tell us something? Are we in the future? And what challenges does that give us? as designers and theatre makers. So all of these questions above um, are starting points for things we can research. So here's an example I've included where I was designing a show and brutalist architecture was um, something I was looking into as a theme and a possible design reference. So in that case, geographically, does the city that the play is set in make a difference? So for example, I've I've included an example of brutalist architecture in Leicester, Manchester and Bristol, because if it is, if I'm using that as a reference and we're setting the show in Leicester, then would it be interesting? Will it be relevant? Will it strike a chord with the audience? If I'm referring to some brutalist architecture that is in Leicester that I recognise that other people might recognise. Um, so if we, if we are in a city, are we in the suburbs? Are we right in the city centre? That has a massive impact, especially somewhere like London. You know, the city has a very different vibe at the weekend, for example, than it does in the week. Um, are there any shops that are mentioned in the, in the script that we need to include? So what sort of shops are they? What do they look like? Um, are there neon lights, statues, people's houses? What, whereabouts are we in that city and what is contained there? And are there any specific stage directions in the text that need to be included, like a cash point that someone uses or is there a stairwell? Um, is someone described as being on a bridge, for example? So continuing to use this example of brutalist architecture, does it have an impact what country we're in? And does this change it in some way? Does this add something or confuse the storytelling? And again, I've had, there are some good examples here of how brutalist architecture has been approached in three different countries. And, you know, they have a similar theme, but they're different. There are subtle differences. And how does that detail help with the storytelling? So socially, who are the people who are inhabiting these spaces? What are their tensions and what are their challenges within the play? How do they relate to each other? And this doesn't just help with the costume design. It helps greatly if you're going to be designing their homes or the places they're inhabiting, um, their personal props. And these are all things that we are familiar with as observers of just day-to-day -day life. But if you are a close observer, which I think you need to be as a designer, then you're picking up on clues that help explain something about a character to an audience member with just their costume, with just their props, because people identify with it, they recognise it, and it helps fill in the gaps. So you're trying to tell as much of the story you can without maybe obviously pointing things out, but a costume can do a lot of the storytelling and explaining. So in terms of research, if you're going to be setting your play at a particular time, then historically and politically this is going to have a big impact on the research you're doing and how that time is impacting on the characters and on the general landscape and atmosphere of the play. Um, so who's in power? How is this affecting things? And what are the struggles and tensions of the people who live during this time? Um, what else is happening in the world? You know, how is that colour and how does that affect things? Um, you're just trying to really immerse yourself in that time. And you might be looking at maybe other plays that were written at that time. They can give you clues, films that were made at that time, books that were written. It's really interesting to look back at historical archives to get a real vivid picture of how that time looked and felt. So a lot of the visual references I've included so far have been related to a production of 1984 that I was designing for Curve before we went into lockdown last year. And so I've included here some of the films that I used as reference and some of the other material. So I looked at some episodes of Black Mirror, which I thought were very interesting in terms of the visual look and feel of different worlds that they're trying to portray. They do a lot of work set in the future and lots of alternative universes that are really, really interesting to look at in terms of design. I've also looked at a film that 
I really, really love called Children of Men, which is a dystopian film set in the future. A fantastic film to see in terms of uh, design. There's loads of great references in there that I use for lots of projects. It's fantastic. Um, That's also 12 Monkeys, the film 12 Monkeys there in the middle, which is, and again, a dystopian vision of the future. I looked at a lot of uh, dystopian films and literature as as reference and ideas. And also the... um, the sort of Soviet propaganda, the the look and feel and design aesthetic of that was a big influence on my design, the final design ideas for that show. So getting more into character and thinking more about costume and personal props, uh, who are we? Who are the people in the play? So age, how old are the people in your text and what does this mean for their characters? Uh, What interests do they have? What are their jobs? How does this affect what clothes they're going to be wearing? Uh, Where might they buy their clothes from and what does this mean? Something I'll sometimes do is I'll think about what shops the characters might buy their clothes in and then I'll look at those shops and see what sort of clothes they're selling. Um, So you're starting to build up a profile of these people. Um, What are their past experiences and how does this affect what they might wear? So these are all things that you might think of in terms of an an actor's approach to character but it's they're all things that costume designers do as well because you really want to dive deep into that character's psyche their personality because the clothes that we wear reflect who we are as people and they're all great starting points for research when you're designing costumes so I've just included a few examples of how costume design has been used to tell stories um, with three different films. So on the left, we've got the girl with the dragon tattoo. Um, if you saw a girl like that walking down the street, you would assume a few things about her in terms of, you know, she's dressed in really dark clothes. She's covering herself up. She's got dark hair. It's covering her face. She wants to disappear. She doesn't want anyone to look at her. Um, and you might make certain assumptions about the sort of music she likes, sort of books she likes. Um, so all those things... All those details are communicating something to the viewer um, and then the hunger games at the bottom you can see from the costume design how the person in the middle lives a completely different life to the people either side of her you know she'll have different friends she'll have different interests she'll have different income different job and then the two either side of her they you can tell a lot about their lives just from the color of their clothes the texture the fabric they're made of the cut of the clothes it's all helping to tell the story hunger games has a really fantastic costume design if you haven't seen that film So this image on the right is a still from the film A Clockwork Orange, which is directed by Stanley Kubrick. And you see those costumes and think, I don't recognise those costumes from any period in history. And they don't feel familiar to me. They sort of feel almost um, ridiculous. Um, But they are actually really, really disturbing characters in the film. So it's that juxtaposition of something that's almost verging on the silly with a character who's really really horrible that is really interesting and sort of subversive with the with the design of those costumes in that film and if you're looking for a good reference point for film design and costume design then there's some really fantastic Stanley Kubrick films that really uh, push the envelope in terms of design Okay, so there are some other starting points when you're thinking about research that may be a little bit harder to pin down. So when I read through a script, I'm also going to be writing down my gut feelings and my reactions to what's happening. And when I read a script, lots of things will pop into my head and I might be thinking about particular artists or, I don't know, a light installation or a film I've seen or an exhibition I went to or even a person or a place. And I'll write all these things down. And I'll also try and think about how I'm responding and how I'm imagining certain scenes and certain points within the in the script in terms of colour, texture, form, structure, rhythm. I mean, am I thinking this is a busy place? This is a very hard space? This is cold? Um, Yeah, and I'm thinking maybe in terms of positive and negative space. So, you know, are there lots of objects in the space that are pulling my eye or is it very, very dark and there's just a few very key elements in the space? And is that telling the story somehow? And how? why is it that I'm thinking about those things? Um... And also scale, movement, light, as I say, temperature and the space. Um, 
all of these things contribute and help to tell the story. And if you're feeling them from reading the script, then the chances are the audience are going to react in that, in that way from the script as well. So you can use design to help highlight and intensify or even repress certain emotions that you want audience to feel. So you might be playing around a bit with certain things. So maybe there's a, there's a scene in the play which is very light-hearted and very playful, but it may be that the implications of what's happening in that scene are going to lead to something dark and foreboding. Well, do you use the design, um, and maybe the lighting designer uses the light, um, to sort of give a bit of foreshadowing with that scene? So, you know, the possibilities are endless, really, but at this stage as well, I'm trying to be very attuned and aware of my responses um, mentally, physically, emotionally, and how would I interpret those in terms of design. So there's a lot going on at the stage, so it's just about pulling everything together. Okay, so I've talked a bit about how the process begins, how you might get started with your research, how you might find clues in the script, and even though you might design 10 productions of Romeo and Juliet, every single one will be different, everyone will have a different director, a different set of circumstances, and although you might have your favourite artists, designers, uh, sculptors, photographers that you turn to and look to for inspiration, every single project will have a different set of references and touchstones for influence and points of interest to take forward into the design. And what I would say if you are interested in being a designer of any kind or a, a theatre maker of any kind is to just be alert and observe the world around you. Read lots, watch films, take notes, um, start to build up a, a reference library, if you like, of people who you find inspiring and interesting because they'll be who you turn to for inspiration um, through your whole career. So the next stage I'm going to get stuck into the process of getting started with sketching. So the research is ongoing throughout the whole process but you'll get to a point where you need to start sketching and getting your ideas out of your head and onto paper. And sketches can be rough and quick, they don't need to make a lot of sense when you're just working stuff out in your sketchbook. It's when you want to use them to discuss ideas with others that you need to be able to communicate your ideas. But again, you don't need to be a perfect artist, you just need your sketches to be able to communicate with people. So I've got some examples here, they're, you know, they're quite rough, I mean, are they sketches on the left? Someone can draw figures, they know about proportion. I think if you've got a good idea of proportion and you've got maybe the use of um, using line weights to show emphasis, um, but quite often, you know, sketching with a, with a director is done very, very quick and rough on a piece of paper and it's about sharing ideas and moving and developing the idea on. And although, yes, sketches can be very quick and very rough and they're about communicating, the more detail you can put in and the better you can develop your drawing skills, the more you'll be able to add in terms of atmosphere and detail and to get the real feel and emotion of what you're trying to achieve. And I strongly believe that everybody can draw and it's just about practice and getting better and the more confident you are in your drawing skills, the more confident you'll feel as a designer. And it's just, you know, it's a really great skill to cultivate if, if you want to have a career in design. So this is a lovely sketch that shows quite a lot of the atmosphere and the, um, you get a real sense of how this set would feel if you're going to be an audience member at this show. I've included this example of a sketch. This is by Ez Devlin, who's a really, really fantastic, um, really um, has a broad range of projects that she's worked on, so she's worth checking out if you're interested in this design. This is a sketch, and then on the right, this is the final model in real life um, but you can really get a sense and a feel from that really quick sketch where the figures are very very roughly drawn in of how that production will feel in terms of scale and proportion and emphasis and the relationship of the actors with the um, space around them and a really good sense as well of the negative and positive space with just a really really simple sketch. I design a lot of uh, site-specific work and a lot of installation work and I think as well with um, 
potentially the future uh, climate in terms of theatre going public, we're going to see more site-specific work, more installations for people to explore in smaller groups. And a really good way of exploring the scope of your project and what you're trying to achieve um, overall is to use storyboarding. Now, you might recognise storyboarding as a technique used by filmmakers, um, and it's really handy for showing a point of view of the camera, close-ups, emphasis of the scene. But if you're talking about a very, very big promenade performance, a storyboard can be a really good way of just explaining the process, the journey that the audience is going to go on um, and making it really clear. It's all about communicating in a clear way again and sort of a, a really effective way of ordering your thought process and explaining it to other people. So I love using rough models and I use models more and more um, nowadays and a lot more than sketching so I'll I tend to actually not to sketch that much anymore just because models are so quick in terms of communicating so if you've got a model in a meeting you know the director can pick bits up we can say oh that feels a bit big actually well, let's tear a bit off let's um try and glue these two bits together and see how that will feel and it's it becomes more of a tool and everyone can relate to a model once you've got a figure in there you can really get a sense of scale and the uh, choreographer can look at it and immediately say well there's not enough room there for that dance moment in the play uh, a lighting designer can look at it and start to assess where they might put lights so the sooner I can do a model, the better. And also I feel like in terms of playing with colours and textures and different forms, it's just, it's I'm getting to the essence of what I'm trying to do a lot, lot quicker. So this is uh, a collection of images from a rough model I made for Jekyll and Hyde, which was for Curve Studio. And I mean, I think I'm pretty pleased with these photos in terms of the way that I was using them to to show my ideas to the rest of the creative team but these were incredibly quick and I did uh, the floor with just a stencil they're just printed off um, textures and wallpapers that I then just glued onto bits of card and the next stage of this model would be actually using maybe some wood veneers for the doors, maybe using a bit more of a textured paper um, to get a bit more of a feel of the um, the uh, the realness of what I was trying to achieve and, and to make something a bit more accurate in terms of texture and atmosphere. But as a rough model, as a way of communicating, um, this is a really, really good skill to, to have and to work on. And again, so if your drawing skills, um, you're not as confident with your drawing skills, then it may be that making rough models um, is, a, is a way that you can communicate your ideas a lot easier. So a big part of the design process is the collaboration between you and your fellow creatives. So the design will evolve when you start to discuss the model box in meetings with the lighting designer, sound designer, choreographer, movement director. And I truly believe that a really great production is the result of a truly collaborative creative team because when everyone's bouncing ideas off each other, then it evolves and gets better and better with everyone's input. Um, and that's why as well in the meetings, if you've got a a really good rough model box and everyone's there everyone can imagine it everyone can picture it and everyone can contribute and add their own areas of expertise and experience so you're not just collaborating with the director and the rest of the creative team you're also collaborating with the production team so there are hundreds of people involved in bringing a show to life you'll have prop makers set builders scenic artists stage management team the sound and lighting departments, and then you've got cutters, costume makers, wigs. The list is endless, and all of these people will have their own skills and experience, which is invaluable to certain costume designers. And I really love when the design is shared with the heads of department, and they bring their own unique, specialised view on how things could be done. And this is all. This is a really exciting part of the process, where I learn loads of things about how the show could be. So a big part of being a set and costume designer is having a grasp of the technical details. So we're not expected to be experts in all the really, really technical 
um, elements of putting on a show, but we need to have some idea of how things might work. And a big part of the production process is working out how these technical details might be achieved. And you want to get as much work and energy put into problem solving and getting these things to a good stage before you go into the tech, because that time is so, so precious. And I've put an example up here, which is um, a show called Songs of the Wanderers. And during the show, 3.5 tonnes of rice fell onto the stage and it was sort of raked, as you can see on this left photo. And then, you know, it was danced with. It was just, it was an integral part of the show. So the technical element of that would have been incredibly important at every stage. And, and then, ha you know, what, how the rice is collected up and, and toured onto the next venue. So, yeah, this is a really, really important part of the process. And, and some an area where designers just learn, learn more and more on each show. And you might also be thinking about if there's any flying in this in the show or any special effects. The more research and um, technical um, prepara preparation you can do before the show, the better. So you might practice some special effects before you go into the tech, just so you're ready, as ready as you can be. So the final model is probably the most important tool that the set designer produces through the whole process. So this will be the result of all the development, all the meetings, different departments um, are giving their expertise. And this final model is used um, by the set builders to get the set exactly as the set designer has envisaged. The scenic artist will use it to get all the finishes right and the colours and the textures. It's used in the rehearsal room to communicate with the actors by uh, stage management use it, the directors use it. And it just it's the touchstone for everyone to get a real sense of how this set is going to work in the space and how all of the different departments and the actors will be interacting with it. So being able to make a really detailed, accurate to scale set model is a really important part of the job. And it's a way for everyone to feel confident about any big scene changes. You can literally check if one bit of scenery will go through another bit of scenery. And if you're making your model box to the size of the theatre, then you can even see where the scenery is going to live off stage when it's not being used. So... Yeah, this is a really important part of the process. And usually when I get the model back at the end, it's a, it's a bit dogged and a bit broken. But I really like that because it shows that all the departments have used it and it's done its job. And everyone loves looking at, at the model and playing with the model. So we're moving into the build period and the rehearsals. So some things can change when the director begins to work with the actors in the rehearsal period, but a lot of the big decisions about set and costume are harder to change at this stage. So during this time, while rehearsals are going on, there are lots of meetings for the designer with the builders, the prop makers, stage management and costume. And you're really going around all those departments and they're showing you where they're at with things, checking things are okay. You'll be doing lots of costume fittings. And it's a really, really exciting exciting time because you get to see everything come together and there are rehearsal notes after every days of rehearsal so things will be coming through on there that you need to check and attend to there might be new props that need to be designed or referenced um, so this is a really exciting time everything's coming together So we're almost there. It's tech week and we're moving towards opening the show. Uh, the first uh, stage is that the set is fitted up and uh, the designer is normally there to see that and to check everything's going in where it should be. And then the lights are rigged, they're focused and plotted. The band or the orchestra, if there is one, will need to do sound checks. And then the tech rehearsal begins. And tech is where we go through the whole show and... We don't usually do lots of um, sort of long scenes, but we're going from the, the cues in the script. We're doing any big set changes and we're looking at lights and sound and any technical effects. And text can last anything between half a day and weeks on end. Um, 
and you're trying to always aim to have at least one dress rehearsal before the first show with an audience, but hopefully two dress rehearsals if you can. And then there are usually some preview shows, and that's to iron out any technical issues and get feedback from invited audiences and make the show as good as it can be before press night. So I haven't spoken yet about sustainability and theatre and it's something that's really, really important to me and I thought I'd put it in here at the end. So as responsible theatre makers, we all need to think about what happens to the set and costumes at the end of the show. And also hopefully there have been some meetings at the beginning of the process about how we can be as carbon neutral as possible and to really think about where we're getting our materials from and who's provide them, who was paid to make them. Uh, so we're aware of where everything's come from and we're taking responsibility for that. Uh, but at the end of the show, um, there are a lot of things to consider. So we have all this stuff that we bought for the show. What happens to it? If the show isn't going to tour, then is it going to be stored? Is it going to be donated to someone else? Um, and the aim, obviously, is to prevent as much as possible going into landfill um so hopefully this is going to be more of a, a consideration moving forward for theatre companies but um the materials we use and their life for the show and beyond the show is a really important consideration okay that's it um i hope you enjoyed that and that gives you some idea of all the different stages the designer goes through when they're designing a production um i really enjoyed putting it together for you Thank you so much for your time and goodbye.